Today in the workshop, we'll be working with OLED displays. We'll see how we can connect both I2C and SPI displays to an Arduino Uno. We'll even build a temperature and humidity meter. We have a lot on display for you today, so welcome to the workshop. Hello and welcome to the workshop. Today we're going to be working with organic light emitting diodes or OLEDs. Now OLEDs can be called a 21st century display product even though they were developed during the 20th century. The very first commercial device to use OLEDs was a Kodak camera in 2003. In 2013, Samsung became the first company to release OLED televisions, and they're now the biggest manufacturer in the world of OLED television screens. Now, the OLEDs we're going to be using are not as big as TV screens. They're very small ones. I've got an example of one over here. These are the type of devices that you will see on things like radios, MP3 players, and smartwatches, and they're very good for using with an Arduino. As a display, these things have a lot of excellent properties. They're very easy to read, they're bright, they take very little current, you can read them from different angles, so it's really useful to know how to work with one in an Arduino. Now I'm going to actually work with a couple of different OLEDs today. The OLED I'm holding over here is an SPI one. I've also got a couple of I2C bus OLEDs. I'll show you how to hook both of those up to the Arduino and how to run some code to use them. Now we're going to go through a bit of example code. We're going to quickly go through it because it contains a lot of graphic stuff that we really don't need. What I really want to show you is how you can write to an OLED. And in order to do that, what I've done is I've developed a small project. It's a temperature and humidity meter that uses an OLED as a display. And with that project, I'll go through the code bit by bit so you know how to use an OLED in your own projects. So let's get going and learn a bit about OLEDs and start working with them in the Arduino. OLEDs are organic light emitting diodes. Organic molecules are molecules that contain carbon. OLEDs use organic molecules to emit light. Organic semiconductors were first discovered in the mid 1970s and led to a Nobel Prize in the year 2000. The first practical OLEDs were developed by laboratories at Kodak in 1987. Now let's take a look at the difference between an LED and an OLED. Internally, an LED consists of an N and a P-type semiconductor material. An OLED consists of several layers of organic molecules. In an LED, there is a gap between the two sections of semiconductor material. In an OLED, the different layers are sandwiched together between plates. The components of an LED are as follows. You're probably familiar with them. There is the cathode, and there is the anode material. The layers of an OLED are as follows. First the cathode, then the emissive layer, then the conductive layer, and then the anode. These layers are sealed between the top layer, called the seal, and the bottom layer, called the substrate. When current is applied to a standard LED, electrons travel between the anode and the cathode. As they cross the gap, light is emitted. In an OLED, the electrons travel through the layers. The emissive layer emits light. OLEDs have several advantages. They're thinner and lighter than LCDs and LEDs, and they can also be flexible, allowing the use of curved displays. OLEDs are brighter than standard LEDs. OLEDs consume very little current, 
OLEDs don't require any backlighting like LCDs do. You can create very large OLED screens because OLEDs are printed onto a substrate. OLEDs have a very wide field of view approaching 170 degrees, so they look good from any angle. There are also a few disadvantages to OLEDs. Blue OLEDs have a shorter lifespan than standard blue LEDs. Currently, OLEDs are quite expensive to manufacture. OLEDs can also be damaged by exposure to water. Eventually, OLEDs will become cheaper than LCDs as manufacturing techniques improve. The lifespan of OLED displays is also being improved. OLED displays can be printed onto a substrate, and that brings up a number of unique possibilities. Many new materials are possible, including the possibility of printing OLEDs onto cloth to create clothing that actually can act as a video display. And finally, OLEDs are a lot of fun, so let's start using OLEDs in our Arduino projects now. Now here are the OLED displays that I'm going to be working with in today's video. And as you can see, there are three different sizes. Let's start with the smallest one over here. Now this is a 128 by 32 display, meaning it's got 128 pixels across and 32 down. Let's just take a closer look at it. Now this is just an I2C display, and you can see the uh, I2C connections at the top of the display here. On the back of it, there's really nothing to talk about, just a number of resistors and capacitors and what looks like maybe a small voltage regulator. There's no method of setting the I2C address with this display, so it basically comes configured at the factory. Now this next display over here is twice the size. This is 128 by 64. It's also a two-color display, so the very top 16 pixels down are in yellow, and the remaining 48 are in blue. Now let's take a closer look at this particular one. Again, you can see it's an I2C display, so it's got the connections at the top. If I flip it over, you will see there's a method of setting the I2C address. Now there's a small surface mount resistor sitting on these two pads and if you want to change the address you need to remove it and put it across these two pads over here so it's not quite as easy as a jumper switch but it's only something you'd have to do once. So there's that display. Now this one here, as you can see, is much larger. This is made by Waveshare. And what's interesting about this display, which is 128 by 128, is that this display can be both I2C or SPI. And let's take a closer look at this one over here. You'll see some connections on the side over here for the display. You'll also see a connector that has the same connections on it and Waveshare does supply a cable with the display and that's actually what I'm going to be using. Now as I said it can be set for SPI or I2C. There's a little resistor pad again that you move to one position for SPI and the other one for I2C. Now I've got this in SPI mode and that's how we're going to test this one. So what we have over here then are two I2C OLED displays and one SPI display. So now let's start working with these displays. So we're going to begin by using the two I2C displays I had. That's these two small ones here, the 128 by 32 and 128 by 64 display. So let me show you how you hook that up to an Arduino and then we'll run some code to actually make the displays work. We'll be working with two I2C displays today. One has a dimension of 128 by 64 and the other has a dimension of 128 by 32. The connections on both displays are identical. On the far left side, we start off with the ground pin. Next is the VCC pin, which we will be connecting to 5 volts. Beside that is the SCL connection. This is the I2C clock line. And finally, the SDA connection, which is the I2C data line. Now I'm going to illustrate the large display in my connection diagram, but keep in mind connecting the smaller display is identical. From the Arduino, 
We'll connect the ground to the ground connection on the OLED display. We'll connect the Arduino's 5 volt output to the VCC on the display. We'll then connect analog pin A5 to the SCL connection on the OLED display. And finally, we'll connect analog pin A4 to the SDA connection. Now your Arduino may have separate connections for SCL and SDA, and if so, feel free to use those instead of the analog connections. They're actually internally the same connection. Now that we have it wired up, let's take a look at some code to put something onto our OLED displays. So now that we've hooked up our display, we're going to need to write some code to make it work. Now in order to facilitate that, we are going to need to install a library, and there are many libraries you can use for OLEDs. OLED displays typically have a driver chip, and the driver chip in both of these displays are the same. It's called an SSD1306, and there are a number of libraries you can use to control the SSD1306 driver chip. I'm going to be using a library from Adafruit to control this display. It was originally written for one of their displays, but it can be used with pretty well any display that uses the same driver chip. Another library is also going to be installed, and it's an Adafruit graphics library, and this is just going to be used to draw a number of patterns on the display. So we'll install those libraries and then run a few bits of their test code that come included with it so we can take a look at our displays in action. So let's go ahead and do that. In order to work with our OLED display, we're going to need to install a couple of libraries into our Arduino IDE. Now, there are several Arduino libraries you can use for working with OLEDs. I've decided to use a couple from Adafruit. Now, you install libraries by going into your library manager, which you will find under Sketch and Include Library, and then Manage Libraries. Open up the Library Manager and you'll be able to install some new libraries. Now there are two libraries we're going to install. They're both from Adafruit and you can search for them up on the search line over here. The first one is the Adafruit GFX library. So type in Adafruit GFX. And here we have it over here. Now, as you can see, I've got mine installed, but if you don't have it installed, when you hover over it, you'll get an install button. For example, if I go to the next library, you'll see the install button over here on the right side. So just click install, which will install this library, and then go search for another Adafruit library, this time the Adafruit SSD1306. And here we have the SSD1306 library. Again, I've got mine installed, but you'll need to hit the install button to install yours. Once you've done that, you can close the library manager. Now go into File, and go into Examples, and go down near the bottom where you'll see Examples from Custom Library, and look at Adafruit SSD1306, and you'll see four example files. Now we're using a 32-bit, uh, sorry, a 32-line display, and I've got it connected via IC2, I2C. So let's go and click on that one right now, and that's the one that I've got opened up over here. Okay, so let's take a look at this sketch. Now, I'm not going to go through the entire sketch because it's a very long sketch which goes through a lot of the graphics library to draw all sorts of graphics and animations on the screen. And if you want to draw graphics and animations, there are some good examples here. However, I'll go over some of the key aspects of it for you. First of all, we're including both the SPI and wire libraries. Now, personally, I think this is an error over here. I think it's because Adafruit has these four sketches and two of them do SPI, that they've just done this um, because all the sketches have it. I really don't think that this particular code needs the SPI library, but it does indeed need the wire library. The wire library is included in your Arduino IDE, and this is the way we talk to I2C. Then, of course, we're going to include the two libraries we've just installed. 
Now here's some of the things you'll need to know when you set up the program. We've got the screen width and the screen height as a couple of constants defined over here. And this is what would change if you're using a different OLED display based on the uh, SSD 1306 chip, but a different size. You could change this over here. Now, one thing I need to mention, if you're looking at some instructions on the internet for using this library, you may find some instructions for going and modifying the library file to use 32 line displays. This is no longer necessary. The new version of the library has corrected that issue. Okay, after that, we need to define an object which we're going to call display. Now, what's interesting about this definition is that this definition uses a parameter called OLED reset, which is a reset pin. Some of the Adafruit devices had a separate reset pin, and this needed to be defined. Now, the devices we're using don't have this reset pin, but you actually need to define it in your code in order to be able to create this object. So keep this in mind. After that, there's a number of definitions that just have to do with the data they're going to be displaying on the screen. For example, the number of snowflakes in an animation example. I won't go through all of those with you. One interesting thing is this is the Adafruit logo as a bitmap, and it shows you how bitmaps work. And that's an interesting thing to know because as you're using these displays and you do animations or define custom character sets, you will need to define bitmaps. And I will show you not in this video, but in a future one where I show you animations on screens, how you can define bitmaps. But what I find interesting is this is the Adafruit star symbol. And if you stand away from your screen far enough, you can actually see, perhaps you have to squint to see it, the star in the middle of this pattern over here, because this is actually a pattern of what pixels are on and which pixels are off. And so you'll find that font files um, and uh, logo files and things look exactly like this. Anyway, that's a bit of an aside. In the setup, we're going to go and we're going to initialize our device. Now, one thing that's important that I want to point out over here is the address of the device. This is the address of mine, so it's correct. But if you have a different I2C address on your device, you're going to need to change this over here. Now, after that, we basically will just go through the code. Um, again, I'm not going to go through all of it. I will show you an example later on how to use this library to write your own code to the display, and we'll go through that in detail. But right now, just suffice to say that we're going to clear the display and draw a whole bunch of different things here. And each of these things is defined by a separate function. And you can look below here at those functions to see exactly how they work. What's interesting about this program is it all happens in the setup because the very last thing that they use, the test animate function, is one that runs forever. And therefore, when you get to the loop, there's actually nothing in the loop over here. So again, I'm not going to go through all the code over here. We're just going to take a look at how this looks on our display right now. And then later on, we'll show you how you can write your own text on the display. So let's go and take a look at our display now. Now here's our OLED demo wired up on a solderless breadboard with the I2C and power lines connected back to the Arduino. And uh, so let's start it up and run the Adafruit demo. And it starts up with the Adafruit logo. And then it starts drawing a number of patterns. Now as you can see, this is a pretty bright display. I've uh, got all the lights on the workshop on right now and even under all my LED lighting you can still see this very clearly. And it just runs through all of its different patterns. Right now it's showing a bit of text and you can see how small you can actually make the text on one of these displays. And so it seems like our sketch is working.
Now for our final look at the 32 line display, I thought I'd try something a bit amusing. Now I've got two of these 32 line displays over here, and they both have the same I2C address. In fact, on this particular display, I don't know of any way of changing that address. I've got them in parallel on the I2C data bus right now. Now these are displays. They are not sending data back to the data bus. They're simply picking it up. So though, although you normally don't want two I2C devices with the same address. In this particular case, I think we'll make an exception. And let's take a look at what happens when I start the Arduino up. And it's probably what you expected would happen. Both displays are showing the exact same thing. Now again, this is working because displays are just receiving data from the Arduino. They aren't sending any back. If that was the case, you certainly couldn't have two devices with the same I2C address. And if you wanted to independently address these two displays, of course you'd have to use two ones that had different I2C addresses. But if you want to parallel a display, this is actually a pretty neat technique that you can use. So now that we've seen the 32 line display, let's move on to the 64 line display, which I have wired on my solderless breadboard over here. Now it was quite easy to connect this because the pinouts are identical to the pinouts on this 32 line display, so I simply unplug this and plug this into its place. Now the thing about this display is it also has the same I2C address as this display, so it should actually come up and work with the existing code that we we have. Now as you recall if you need to change the I2C address on this display you can do it by changing the position of a small resistor on the back of the circuit card but without changing it these two have the same I2C address. So before I run any specific code for the 64 line display I thought it might be kind of neat to see what happens when I give it the code for the 32 line display. And it actually comes up and starts running and looks like it runs pretty well. When you look at it carefully though, you'll see the aspect ratio on a number of things are off. There's a number of lines that are missing. The resolution isn't as high because it's only expecting there to be 32 lines and not 64 lines over here. So let's take a quick look at a modification to the sketch, another version that Adafruit has provided for the 64 line display, and then we'll come back and run it on this and see how much better it looks. So to properly run our 64 line display, we will use a 64 line example code that came with the Adafruit libraries. Now this code is virtually identical to the code that we briefly looked at earlier for the 32 line display. In fact, they've even written 32 pixels up over here, even though it's a 64 line one. They've simply changed a couple of lines in the sketch, and that's what I want to show you. Up over here, we've got the display height, which is now 64 and another line that you're going to want to look at because I needed to change it to make mine work is the I2C address. Now when you load this sketch it's going to come up with this address which is 3D hexadecimal. That is not the address of the I2C device I'm using. Mine is at 3C so I had to change it and you would change the address over here. So take a look at that. Otherwise, this is an identical sketch, so what we're going to do is load it up to the Arduino and take a look at it on our 64 line display. So now let's take another look at the 64 line display, this time with the correct sketch driving it. And as you can see, the Adafruit symbol comes up a lot clearer than it did before. And so do the lines. They're a lot closer together. And of course, we would expect that because this sketch knows that we're driving 64 lines and not 32 lines. Another thing that you, of course, will have noticed is that the top of the display is in yellow and the bottom is in blue. This is a two-color OLED display, and these are quite common. You could use the top for some sort of status indicator and the bottom for some sort of text to make a more vibrant display for your users. As you can see from the text display, it's capable of very tiny, tiny text, and it's still very legible. And again, this is being filmed right in the workshop under all of my LED lights, and it's very easy to see. And so there you have it, the 64-line OLED display. 
So now that we've seen how those two I2C displays work, I want to move on to the SPI one. Now that's this wave share device, which as you recall, can be used in both SPI and I2C mode. I'm going to be using it in SPI. Now the Arduino Uno has an SPI bus, as does the Raspberry Pi and many other controllers. The Arduino Uno can control two different SPI devices, so that also opens the option of controlling two different OLED displays via SPI as opposed to doing that with I2C in different addresses. Now I'm going to show you the WaveShare device in a bit more detail. I know we already looked at it but we'll take another look at it and then I'll show you how to hook it up and then we'll install some demonstration software onto our Arduino IDE and watch it on the display. So let's go ahead and take a look at our display now. Now once again, here's our wave share display. We looked at it earlier when we looked at all of the displays. And here's the cable that comes with it. Now this cable can attach to the connector at the back of the display, or you could simply solder some pins onto these pads over here on the display. It's really up to you. They're the same connections. The cable has a number of female connectors on the end of it, so that won't plug directly into an Arduino Uno. I'm going to be using some some little jumper cables in order to assist me with that. If you want to use a Raspberry Pi with this, this will plug directly into the GPIO connector on the Raspberry Pi. Now once again let's take a peek at the back of our display and we saw this before that there's a little jumper down here that puts it into SPI or I2C mode and this is currently in SPI mode. Now when you go into I2C or SPI mode the function of a couple of the pins change and they have a little chart over here that shows you that. Uh, interestingly, when you're in I2C mode, you can use this DC connection and either bring it high or low, and that will set the I2C address. But we're going to use our little wave share display in SPI mode. So let's take a look at how we are going to do that. Now I'm going to use the connector that WaveShare provided to connect my display to my Arduino, but you could also use the pins on the display and use a solderless breadboard instead. Using the cable, the connections are as follows. The VCC, which is the red wire, is connected to the Arduino 5 volt output. The ground, which is the black wire, is connected to the Arduino's ground. The D-in connection, which is the blue wire, is connected to Arduino pin 11. The CLK connection, which is the yellow wire, is connected to Arduino pin 13. The CS, or orange wire, is connected to Arduino pin 10. The DC connection, or green wire, is connected to Arduino pin 7. And the RST, or white wire, is connected to Arduino pin 8. In order to work with the 1.5 inch OLED module from WaveShare, we're going to need to install a few files into our Arduino IDE. We can get these files on the WaveShare wiki for the 1.5 inch OLED module. You'll find the URL to that wiki in the article accompanying this video. Once you get there, go take a look for demo code and open up that page. I've got it open up over here. And amusingly, they've got a bit of a spelling mistake here. It's a 1.5 inch OLED module, apparently. At any rate, download the 1.5 inch OLED module file. It's a zipped file, so you're going to need to extract it. Let me show you that here. Now, on the right side pane, I've got my file and I've extracted it, and it creates a directory called 1.5 inch OLED module, which I'm going to open up. And in that directory, you'll see three other directories Arduino, Raspberry, and STM32. Let's open up the Arduino directory. Now, on this side of my file manager, I'm showing you the contents of my own Arduino directory. This is the directory where all my Arduino sketches are used, and it is set up by your Arduino IDE. You'll find it on your local hard drive, and it'll probably be called Arduino. Now, you're going to need to move some files from here into there. The first ones we're going to look at are in this directory called lib, which means library, and you'll find one that says fonts. Now, in the Arduino IDE, all of 
of your libraries are kept in this folder called libraries. So open up your local folder called libraries in the Arduino directory and copy these fonts into there. Now I've already done that. If you already have a fonts folder, you can also open up this folder and just copy the contents of that into these font folders. Once you've done that, you can return back out to this stage here and we'll bring our Arduino directory back to over here. Now there are two sets of examples here, one for external RAM and one for internal RAM. External RAM requires that you actually add additional RAM to your Arduino. We obviously aren't going to do that, so let's go to the internal RAM example. And you'll notice one called OLED Show. Copy that entire folder into your Arduino IDE, as I've done over here. And then in the OLED Show, you will notice that you have a number of files, including an OLED show INO file. Open up that file, load it into your Arduino IDE, and load it up to the Arduino. Now, I'm not going to go through that file with you right now. It's very complicated. You're welcome to go through it yourself. I'm simply going to show you the results. So I've taken that file, put it into my IDE, and loaded it up to my Arduino. So now let's go take a look at it. So here's our WaveShare display running the demo sketch. Now, as you can see, I've used the cable that they provided to attach it to the Arduino. And because their cable has female ends on it, I just used very short jumper wires to make the connections to the Arduino itself. So let's take a closer look at this display if we can. Now, as you can see, it's a pretty nice display. They've got a number of different symbols on it to show you what you can do with it, along with their fake clock in the middle and a bit of text. And as you can see, it's very clear. It's very easy to see even under the lights of the workshop right now. So this is another excellent display that you could use for one of your projects. And the beauty of this one is that you could use it either as I2C or with the SPI bus. So it's quite versatile as well. So now we've seen how we can hook up an OLED to an Arduino using both SPI and I2C. We've also installed a couple of libraries and some sample code into our IDE, and we've been able to use that to make the OLED work, and that's great. Now, if you want to use OLEDs in your own project, you can go into the sample code and dissect it and start seeing how you can print to the OLED. And that's also a really useful exercise. However, you might find with some of these samples it's a bit overwhelming. These are very, very long pieces of code, and they contain a lot of graphics routines. The WaveShare one directly addresses fonts, and that might seem a bit complex if all you want to do is display a bit of data on an OLED display. So in order to make things a bit simpler, I've created a little project. It's a temperature and humidity meter. It uses an OLED display, and I'm going to go through the code with you step by step so you understand how you can print text on the OLED. Now, there's no graphics on this. It's just simply text. Now, the sensor I'm using is kind of interesting. This is the AM2320 sensor. Now, I know it looks a lot like the DHT11 and DHT22, and it works the same. It's a temperature and humidity sensor, but this is an I2C device. I've used it in a previous project, you might recall. So it's an I2C device. We're also going to use an I2C display. I'm going to use the 128 by 64 display for this. So let's take a look at how we wire up our temperature and humidity meter, and then after that I will walk you through the code so you can understand how to use OLED displays in your own projects. Now to build our temperature and humidity display, we're going to start with the same circuit we already have for our I2C display. We'll then add the AM2320 temperature and humidity sensor. We'll connect the sensor as follows. Starting from the left side, we'll connect the first pin to VCC, that's the 5 volts from the Arduino. The second pin is the SDA pin. That's the analog A4 connection on the Arduino. The third pin is the ground. And the pin on the far right side is the SCL connection, which is Arduino analog A5. Now that we have our temperature and humidity sensor connected, let's take a look at the sketch we'll use in order to display the temperature and humidity on the OLED display. 
Here's a sketch for our OLED temperature and humidity meter. Now you've already installed the libraries we're going to need for the OLED displays, but you're going to need to install a library for the temperature and humidity sensor itself. So again, you'll do that in your library manager and you will look for the Adafruit AM2320 library and install that. And while you're there, look for the Adafruit Unified Sensor Library. Now, the Unified Sensor Library may already be installed because it's used by a number of Adafruit sensors, including the 2320. But if you don't have it, install that as well because it won't work without it. Now that you've got the required libraries, let's take a look at the sketch. Now we start off by including the Arduino wire library so we can talk on the I2C bus. Then we include the two libraries we need for the OLED display, the, Ar the graphics library and the SSD1306 library. Now we include the library we just installed for the temperature and humidity sensor. Notice we don't include the unified sensor library. The temperature and humidity library will call that library. Now we're going to set up an object to represent the OLED display called display and in order to do that we need to provide it a parameter called OLED reset. So we're going to set an OLED reset value even though we don't actually use it. That's just so we can set this object up over here called display and this will represent our OLED display. We're also going to set up an object called AM2320 and that will represent the temperature and humidity sensor. Now in the setup, we'll just initialize all of these different objects. So we're going to initialize the I2C library. We'll initialize the display and we'll give it the I2C address, which is 3C. Now, if you have a different address for your display, you'll need to change this parameter. And then finally, we'll initialize the temperature and humidity sensor. Now, the majority of the action in this sketch happens in the display temp humid function, which we're going to go over right now. So we'll start off by delaying for a full two seconds. That's because the temperature and humidity sensor needs a couple of seconds to stabilize. Then we'll go and read the humidity and temperature and assign them to a couple of floats called H and T. Now the temperature is going to come back in Celsius. If you look in the AM2320 manual, you will find that there is also a function you can bring it back in Fahrenheit if you wish. Now, this is how we write on the display, and this will be true of any time you want to write to an OLED display. First of all, we clear the display. We're actually clearing a display buffer because we're writing to a buffer, which will eventually print out to the display. Then we set the color, and we are going to use white for a monochrome display, no matter what the actual color of the display is. So we set the text color to white. Then we'll set the font size. I'm setting mine to 1. Then we're going to set up the cursor coordinates. Where do we want to place the cursor to start printing? And so I'm going to pick the top corner, which is 0, 0. This is the uh, position on the line, and this is the line itself. And so now we're going to print something there. And I've chosen to print DroneBot Workshop. You could, of course, print something else, but you're welcome to print DroneBot Workshop if you like. Now I'm going to move the cursor down, position 0 on line number 10. And I'm going to print the word humidity followed by a number of spaces. Then I'm going to print the value of the humidity, which has been assigned to the variable H. And then I'm going to print a space and the percent sign. Now I'm going to move my cursor down again to another position on the 20th line at the zero position. And I'm going to print the word temperature followed by a couple of spaces, the actual temperature value, and then a space and a C because I'm displaying in Celsius. And so we'll go into the loop and the loop is quite simple. We just call display temp humid, which we just looked at, get all those values written into the buffer, and then we simply use a display property to actually display them. And then we can go over and over and do it again and again. So now that you've seen the sketch, let's take a look at our temperature and humidity sensor. So here's our OLED temperature and humidity gauge in action. As you can see right now in the DroneBot workshop, the humidity is a very comfortable 49.7%. 
and the temperature is 21.8 degrees Celsius, which is a bit on the cool side, but I just cranked the thermostat on, so it should be going up pretty soon. Now, it's a very simple thing to wire up. Here's the I2C temperature sensor, and it's disconnected in parallel to the I2C bus that I've got the OLED display connected to. So, a very simple circuit to wire up, and a good demonstration of how to use an OLED display. All right, that about wraps it up for our look at OLEDs today. Hopefully you've learned something and that you've started to think about using OLEDs in your own Arduino projects. Now the horizon looks very bright for OLEDs. The cost of manufacturing these will continue to go down to the point where they eventually become cheaper than LCD displays or regular LED displays, and that's something to look forward to. Another thing to look forward to is the fact that they can print OLEDs onto a variety of different substrates and that includes things like cloth and so eventually you'll be able to make wearable clothing that actually is a video screen so you can imagine if my shirt was actually a video screen that opens up a whole world of possibilities now we aren't going to be working with anything so esoteric over here in the workshop that soon but I do have a number of interesting projects and so if you haven't subscribed to the YouTube channel please do just hit the little button below the video and subscribe I would very much appreciate that. You'll also find an article that goes along with this video. You'll find it on the dronebotworkshop.com website and there's a link below the video to that. While you're on the website, please consider subscribing to my newsletter. It's not a sales letter, it's just my way of keeping in touch with you and letting you know what's going on in the workshop. And I'll tell you there's a lot of new things about to happen here in the workshop, so if you subscribe to the newsletter, you'll be among the first to know. Until next time, please take care of yourselves, and I hope to see you again very soon right here in the workshop. Goodbye for now.